Before we begin, I wanted to offer a few words for as most of you are quite aware, it has happened again, a young black man's life and the life of his three children who watched him shot by law enforcement have been forever altered. This is not only painfully exhausting, it is also incredibly heartbreaking. No doubt police work is incredibly stressful and hard. It involves tense and unpredictable moments, but somehow we need to find a different way forward. Excessive responses need to be brought to an end, and whatever our various suggestions for solutions might be, something needs to change. Solutions need to be cultivated, developed, and acted. For the life of Jacob Blake and his children and the lives of our black brothers and sisters who have been uniquely affected by these kinds of events, well, they matter too much for us not to take action. The scripture makes it clear throughout Psalm 33 in particular, God loves justice, breaks his heart when wrong is done in the world. And it's in that context, oddly, that we are called to worship. Why? Well, because ultimately our trust, as the psalm puts it, isn't in princes, it's not in political leaders, it's not in human beings who don't have the power to save. No, our hope is in the God of Jacob. Uh, we are in pain, and yet God moves towards us in our pain, not away from us. That's been evidenced in Jesus. He deeply cares about our world. And therefore, worship throughout the history has always take place, taken place in a context of suffering and pain and brokenness, but still with an eye on a God of hope, a God of power, a God who can change us and change our world. And therefore, won't you take these few moments as we listen to the prelude to prepare your hearts to joyfully worship the one who has power to change our hearts, our country, our world, all for his glory. One. Greetings, and welcome to Redeemer Presbyterian Church downtown and to our online Sunday services. We are so glad you are with us today. My name is Andres Quintero, and I'm the youth pastor at downtown. And as we quiet our hearts and quiet our minds to have fellowship with God, let me prepare us for worship. Now that we're starting classes, um, I remember vividly, I had the fortune to come to the States for graduate school, even though I come from a more modest architectural department. But there's one thing I remember about this school when I was an international student, this school fascination with uh, world-famous architects. Every trimester, every quarter, they will hang in the main hall these huge banners with uh, names printed like uh, Frank Gehry, Rem Kulhas, Stephen Hall. And only after one year, one of my classmates shared with me this embarrassingly. Andres, uh, those banners are not there just for decoration. Those are actually the names of our guest speakers for our lecture series, and all the students are invited to come. 
Then I replied, are you telling me Frank Gehry came here and I missed him? She said, yes. I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. Um, I thought this was caused perhaps by my uh, tendency to be so wrapped up in my own world or the fact that I was a library mouse, only interested in my good grades. So today, in this hall, in your very own homes, there is this bigger name, visiting. He wants to have fellowship. We're going to sing about his name in every hymn. He's going to be in every scripture. His name is Jesus. And I want to encourage you, don't be like me. Do not miss probably the greatest guest in your life because you're so wrapped up in your life, because you're so concerned about good grades. He wants to commune with you. Now, if you want to enjoy fellowship with him, welcome to worship. Please stand and take a posture of reverence as we sing this first song. Oh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three. 
Please join me in the call to worship. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. The sorrow of those who run after other gods will increase. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you alone are the Lord. We praise you for dwelling among us and calling us your people. Though we were your enemies, you sent your only son, begotten son, to die on the cross so we could enter into your family. Since the beginning, it pleased you to intervene by coming into our rescue. There is nothing good, special, or worthy in us, yet you became a vulnerable, poor baby for our sake. Your son gave up his divine privilege and became a servant so we could become your people, your nation, royal priesthood, God's special possession. And it is through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that we can sing to you this morning and not be quiet and earnestly pray to you, just as your son taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Flow. Bring 
now we have come to a time of confession. Living with two teenagers and a baby daughter in a two-bedroom apartment, with the prospects of no visitors in the near future, has taught me the ability of chaos to creep in. I'm talking about the living room converted permanently in a baby entertainment center. Piles of stacked and read newspapers. Dozens of shoes by the entrance having some sort of happy hour. Not to mention the face masks that keep reproducing like rabbits. Of course, nobody knows about this in our Zoom calls or virtual meetings, as every family member has mastered the art of the perfect screenshot. It's not a pretty view. And the more we neglect to clean, the heavier this burden builds up. The more we neglect, there is this feeling of hopelessness. This piling up of unchecked clutter looks a lot like sin. The more you leave it untouched, the more deadly it becomes. It stinks. Sin produces death. But here are the good news. Jesus, he is in the business of removing all this harmful stuff from our polluted hearts. He wants to clean us. He wants to renew us. He can make us a new creature. If we honestly confess our sins, he will make us holy as we have never seen before. With that in, in, that in mind, please join me in the prayer of confession together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. I want to encourage you to take a time to go back and meditate on this prayer Make it your own. Let's confess our sin in silent humility to our God and our Father.
bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean. Now hear these words of pardon for all of those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation, found on Psalm 103. Together. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion of those who fear him. This is the good news. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Before we move to the passing of the peace, I want to share with you a few announcements. Here at downtown, we have a youth group, and it's our aim and purpose to create uh, opportunities to have fellowship and discipleship. We are huge on um, reading the scriptures. I guarantee you that if any student comes to our weekly classes, by the end of one year, they will become Bible scholars. Now, we are also invested heavily in fellowship, and we have amazing volunteers, and they come from so many different backgrounds. We have an illustrator, a policewoman, uh, an officer that works uh, for Citibank, all over, and they are heavily, they're invested in our students. They're uh, bonding with them. We are also um, huge in uh, retreats and mission trips. Every year we go to uh, South America where we partner with this organization that cares for uh, children in extreme poverty. So our students know that what privilege is to have a toilet inside your apartment with a roof. So next time they bump into a foreigner, an immigrant, first, first, uh, first generation. They know why they're here. Um, so I want to encourage you, if you know of any children in your building, in middle school, in high school, we would love to connect. If your colleagues' children, they need to uh, hang out to play games, basketball, be in the park, we have wonderful volunteers. We would love to connect. Or perhaps you want to uh, invest in the life of a student. I have learned more about uh, God and the Word, wo walking with these students that go into seminary. So I will encourage you, please take a step forward, uh, a leap of faith, and invest in the life of our students. You can connect with me with uh, writing to my email that will appear on your screen, and I would love to hear from you. Take a moment now for the passing of the peace. Pause and send texts and messages to your friends, your loved ones, and as we do here on stage as well. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. One, two, three.
the Lord be with you. I hope you'll reach out to someone today and share the peace of Christ with them if you haven't already. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Psalm, chapter 72. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May grain abound throughout the land. On the tops of the hills may it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Why don't you please join me in prayer? Oh Lord, our God, we come to you with so many hard things going on in our lives and in our world right now. And Yet you have the words of life, and it's to you, therefore, that we go. Would you speak to each of us those things that we need to hear during this time? We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. In John 12, we're told of some men who come to one of Jesus' followers with this request. Sirs, we would see Jesus. It's the thing that they most wanted, and actually it's the thing that they most needed. And it's also the Christian conviction that that's the thing that all of us most need as well. Because in seeing Jesus for who he really is, there's the possibility of transformation for our lives as individuals, for our communities, for our neighborhoods, for our cultures, even for the entire world. And there are always, of course, new facets of Jesus to be seen new glimpses to be had, new insights to gain. And of course, there are things that we need to see again and again because they're easily forgotten, even though we think we know them well. Of course, there are also a lot of false portraits of Jesus that can send us on a wrong trail. And so where do we get the correct glimpse of Jesus? Well, it's in the scriptures. And in this season, we've been looking in particular at the Psalms and the way that they shine a light on who Jesus is. Psalm 72 is a case in point. It's a portrait of a king that's been read to us. It was initially written with the kings that were to follow David in mind. But both then and throughout Christian history, it has been interpreted as pointing to and as a portrait of Jesus Christ. One commentator puts it like this. He says, as a royal psalm, it portrayed, it was a prayer for the reigning king. It was a strong reminder of his high calling. Yet it exalted this so far beyond the humanly attainable as to suggest for its fulfillment no less a person than the Messiah, not only to Christian thinking, but to Jewish thinking as well. Well, this passage tells us a number of things about the beauty of the king. But today we want to focus on verse 6, which says this, May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers 
watering the earth. It's striking imagery. And if you soak in it, it's enough to take your breath away. Because you see, when grass has undergone the violence of the blade, well, it's at its most fragile at that moment. It's at its most vulnerable. It is most susceptible to disease and further damage. And it's not, there's nothing that the grass needs more at that moment than a gentle rain to fall, to renew, to refresh it, to bring healing and strength to it again. Nothing better at that moment could be asked for. And the poet uses this beautiful imagery of rain falling on a mown field to refer to we are ourselves, our weary and broken selves. Because uh, we also are in need of restoration and renewal. Who among us isn't up for that? Most of us are feeling fairly weary and exhausted. To use the biblical imagery elsewhere, we are like bruised reeds and smoldering wicks. And yet we're told that Jesus is not in the business of breaking bruised reeds or snuffing out smoldering wicks. Instead, he's in the business of fanning them into flame. Jesus is, Jesus is in the business of renewal and restoration. He is a king who's interested in all human beings thriving. And this king creates the conditions where we can grow into something beautiful and strong. So what is it that he offers to us that makes him like rain on a newly mown field? How does he refresh us? How does he renew us? Well, three in particular ways that I want to look at today. And the first is this. He, he offers us forgiveness. Most of us, at least one point in time or another, are lost in a sea of past regrets and guilt. And it's nearly impossible to flourish unless we're released from those. Indeed, one head of an English psychiatric hospital said this. He said, I could dismiss half my patients tomorrow if they could be assured that they were forgiven. In 2004, there was a film called Mind the Gap, not particularly well known, but it had this beautiful vignette in it in which there is a man who has uh, cheated on his wife. And as a result, his marriage has come to an end and he no longer is able to spend much time with his son. And he is brought to this place where he is paralyzed by guilt. He's filled with self-hatred and he's ready to actually take his life. And at his moment of desperation, he goes to uh, a pastor, to a priest, who thankfully in this particular film is portrayed as a person who has something to offer others. And this priest actually reads the riot act to this individual. He says, enough with your self-pity. Uh, enough with your suffering martyrdom. They're not getting you anywhere. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever gotten to a place where you haven't simply said you were sorry to your wife and your son, but you've actually asked for their forgiveness and given them the opportunity to offer you that gift because that's just what it is, a gift that God enables us to offer to others. And though he's never considered doing that before, he chooses to do so. He's desperate. And he goes to them and asking their forgiveness, well, miracle of miracles, he receives it. He's released He's set free. You see, to this point, he's defined himself by his failures. And again, that's paralyzing. There's no way to live like that. But God desires that we wouldn't define ourselves by our failures, but instead by the reconciliation and the forgiveness that he offers. When we come to him with some form of meaningful repentance, and of course, none of us ever does that perfect, still, when we come to him that way, what we're told is, well, he, for, he remembers our sin no more. He is ready to move on and he encourages us to move on as well. And he is able to do that, able to offer us that forgiveness because he's offered the great sacrifice of his son for us. Jesus is the one who gives himself in our place. The one who knew no sin becomes sin for us. The one who was uh, completely righteous and perfect gives his life over for the ungodly that they might be reconciled, that they might be forgiven, that condemnation and judgment that paralyzes us might be removed forever. And that's what Paul tells us. He says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And not simply 
no condemnation now at this moment, but from now on. Because Jesus' death on the cross is sufficient to deal not only with our past sins, and not only with our present sin and failures, but also for those failures that we are yet to commit, those ways that we are yet to rebel. So great is that sacrifice that it covers all those things and it means that there is always the possibility and always the offer of a fresh start, which of course is refreshing, it's renewing, it's restorative, it's what we deeply need and not only does it bring restoration and refreshment to us, it also brings a new desire to live in a different way before the face of God, to not so easily fall into failures in the future. So that's one of the ways that Jesus offers us restoration. This king brings to us renewal. But a second way is that he offers us a new identity. Many of us not only feel uh, guilt in our lives and are paralyzed by that, but we feel a profound shame that causes us to hang our heads. We feel like we don't measure up to those around us. So we might have a lot of false bravado and talk a good game, but deep down we, well, we know who we are we are not who we ought to be, and so there is a sense of shame that follows us. Uh, a film that my family and I enjoyed very much as our kids grew up was A Knight's Tale that starred the late Heath Ledger. And if you know that story at all, it's about a young boy, William, who's born into poverty, and his dad says to him at one point, William, I want you to change your stars. And so what he, what he does is he apprentices him to a knight, and he starts to serve this knight. Now, knights in those days were, on the one hand, people of royal blood, and they fought for their countries, but they also engaged in a form of Olympic games that uh, all the people came to uh, exalt in and rejoice in, and the pinnacle of those games was the joust. And uh, so William helped serve this knight who engaged in those games. But as fate would have it, uh, one day this particular knight that William is serving dies. And William, who has been caught up in wanting this for himself, decides to put on the knight's armor. And he goes out and he jousts in his place. And suddenly he thinks he's on to something. And he finds ways for false papers to be drawn up so that he is too seen as a person who comes from a royal bloodline. And he goes about uh, engaging in these Olympic kinds of events and the crowd uh, showers him with praise and with glory until one day one of his rivals in these games finds out his true origins. And so knowing that he has lied, he is now put in the stocks and his head bowed before the people in shame, where once he received their praises, now he reserves, receives their jeers. Uh, and yet locked up like that, uh, a, a prince from England, uh, a prince, prince Edward, uh, who has always had a fondness for William, comes to him and he announces before the people this. He has him released from the stocks, and he says about William, he may appear to be of humble origins, but my personal historians have discovered that he is from an ancient royal line. That is my word, and as such, it is beyond contestation. And you see what's going on there. You see, it doesn't matter what the crowds think of William. It doesn't even matter what William thinks of himself. The only thing that matters is what the royalty, <laughs> what the king thinks of William, what his son, the prince, thinks of William. And it is no longer a fiction. Because the king has proclaimed it to be true, he is of royalty. And that is the reality of what God does for us as well. Though we might hang our heads in shame because we so easily fail to live in the ways that we think we ought, what God tells us all the same is that the truest truth about ourselves is that well, we are brothers and sisters of Jesus, our elder brother. And as a result, we are also sons and daughters of the living God, those in whom he delights. And so our heads, though perhaps deservingly bowed, are now, because of what Jesus has done, having adopted us into his family, can be raised. A new identity. And with that identity, a new strength to move out into the world. Restoration, renewal. Well, there's one last thing that this king does to bring restoration, renewal, refreshment. 
And that is, he brings a passion for justice and brings justice to the needy. That's seen throughout the psalm again and again. And so verse 1 says, He will defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. He will crush the oppressor. He will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. For precious is their blood in his sight. And you know, if you've read the Gospels with open eyes at all, you realize there's no accurate picture of Jesus without seeing how he moves towards those who are, who are oppressed, those who are hurting, those who are bowed down, how he moves towards those who are on the margins, those who are disadvantaged. That's his commitment. We can count on it with regards to ourselves. We can count on it with regards to those who are hurting in the world. And the examples in the pages of the Gospels are legion. In one particular passage at the end of Mark chapter 1, Jesus uh, is approached by a leper. And we're told this, A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus was indignant, we're told, and he reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. You know, however he contracted this disease, there were physical and social, religious, economic, emotional implications for this man. He would have been isolated from his community and without the normal means of making ends meet. He would have also been considered one who was really not to be approached. Uh, and yet, whereas other people failed to approach him, Jesus does so, and he places his hands on him. He might be invisible to the rest of society, but Jesus sees him clearly as one who bears God's image, who is also his brother. And in reaching out to him and healing him, in bringing justice to his life, in bringing restorative justice to his life, this man is now put back into a place where he can thrive and where he can flourish again. That is Jesus' passion, to see those who are on the margins, those who are disadvantaged, to see them lifted up. We're told in Psalm 146 that that is what God is all about, that he restores the sight of the blind, that he lifts up the heads of those who are bowed down, that he releases those uh, who have been imprisoned from their chains. Now, God is a God who is passionate for justice, and we see that clearly in Jesus. And so in a world where we see injustice taking place all around us, where that's always been true from the very beginning of time where Cain first slew Abel, well, those are things that God is deeply concerned about. We can count on that. We can depend on that. So this is the Jesus we must see, the one who comes to bring restoration, refreshment, renewal, like rain on a mown field. And the question is simply, are you experiencing him like that? He wants you to. He wants you to draw near to him, to experience the fact that you are the one he delights in. You are the one who he forgives. You are the one whose head he lifts up. And if you are experiencing oppression, he comes uh, to, to take, uh, take that from you, uh, to raise you from the ash heap. That is our Jesus. That is the role he wants to play in your life. The beauty of the king, like rain on a mown field. And if you experience that, if you know it, well, it enables you to go out into the world and be like rain on a mown field in others' lives as well. Why don't you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you that you are one who wants this to change our stars, that you are not content for us to remain in a place where we are weary and exhausted, but you intend to restore, renew, refresh us like rain on a moon field when we are vulnerable and fragile. Lord, would you do that in our lives? And Lord, we would pray for justice for this world. Would you be like rain on uh, the moon field of our current culture where there is so much unrest, where there is uh, so much that is wrong. 
Lord, we pray for the racial wounds in our society to be healed. Lord, we are at a loss uh, as we see events take place again and again. But Lord, we know that you can do something about it. And would you do that? Would you bring comfort? Would you bring peace? Would you bring justice? Would you be like rain on a moon field? We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to take this time to receive our offering now. And so if you want to give yourself to God, that is the first and most important thing to do. But we also encourage you to give your gifts at this time. There's information on the screen that instructs you on how to do that. Hey, won't you join us with all your hearts and minds and with our young people as they lead us in the prayers of the people. Lord, we come to you on behalf of the needs of the people around us, trusting that you'll hear our prayers. Lord, we pray for people who are struggling with depression and loneliness, that you would be with them and comfort them. May you bring them peace health, and the love of Christ. We also pray for the upcoming school year. May you keep everyone safe as they start the academic with either blended or remote learning. Lord, as the new school year begins, we pray for those in leadership that you would guide them in opening schools in the safest way possible. With all the uncertainty, we pray for teachers, counselors, and parents that you would give them patience and wisdom in supporting students as they face the challenges of remote learning. We pray for the students that you may equip them with the proper resources and motivation to study and that they may be able to maintain friendships in this new environment. We pray for your peace and protection on all of us. Dear God, we pray for parents and children living 24 seven together during this tough time. Provide love and grace between family members. Help them to treat one another with love and respect. Lord, we pray for the youth of Redeemer downtown. Give us the grace to not run away from you in our weakness and our sin, but to turn to you and rely on you as our source, our strength, and our hope. Fill us with your precious love that we may experience the love and community that we need as well. Lord, we lift up these needs as well as the safety of our church and our city. In your name we do pray. Amen. One, two, three, four, five.
despite what is going on in the world or in our lives, we, as the children of God, can enter into his presence with thanksgiving and a heart of praise. So, will you please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving together? Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for calling us out of the darkness and into your glorious light. And we remember the price you paid, the death of your only son. We can only wonder and marvel at the greatness of your love. We give our lives to you, Lord, and pray that through your spirit, you teach us how to live according to your will. Send us out now to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of your mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few quick announcements before we receive the benediction. First, if you are in need of prayer or if you're in need of some financial assistance, assistance during this hard season, there are instructions on the screen at the end by which you can receive those things. We hope you'll make use of either of those. Also, we have at 11 o'clock our virtual coffee hour. It's a highlight of Sunday for me as we connect with other people in our congregation, share prayer requests and what's going on in our lives. We hope you'll join us for that. Now let's receive God's benediction. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us that which is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And together we all said, thanks be to God. Go in God's peace. One, two, one, two.